the Roman Empire under Emperor Justinian had seen itself significantly weakened. The West had fallen and been replaced by kingdoms established by Germanic tribes. Meanwhile, Emperor Justinian still ruled in the East. Rome being divided like this was not completely unprecedented in Roman history. First of all, the Visigothic and Ostrogothic kingdoms were ruled by Germanic tribes, but ones that had been Romanized and to an extent saw themselves as part of the Roman world. The people living in Italia at the time would very much still call themselves Romans living in Italia. They simply had a king now, not an emperor. The Roman Empire had been divided in similar crises many times in its history, such as during the crisis of the 3rd century as well as back in the 4th century where Emperor Constantine managed to reunite Rome under one emperor. Rome managed to endure these crises and the 6th century Roman Empire under Justinian could have endured in a similar fashion had things gone differently. Justinian had a different perspective than the Ostrogoths and Visigoths and did see the West as fallen lands. He managed to reconquer much of the West, including Italy, but a major plague outbreak combined with the Persian invasion allowed the Ostrogoths to push back the Romans so they had to conquer the peninsula a second time, leaving it decimated and wide open for an invasion of the Lombards shortly after Justinian's death. But what if this didn't happen and Eastern Rome restored much of the West for good? The first thing that will have to change in this scenario is that the Justinian plague either never happens or is a much smaller outbreak that doesn't cripple the empire. The wars will end with a similar result, a reconquest of much of the west, but it will end earlier with no need for a second invasion of Italy that decimates the peninsula. This would, further down the line, allow for the Romans to mount a proper defense in Italy against the Lombards and leave the Roman Empire with a solid grip on a much wealthier province in the west. This is where our alternate history of the Roman Empire will begin. Following the reconquest of Italia, Rome would be in a great position strategically as its borders would be very defendable and Italia would bring in lots of wealth. This would allow for Rome to continue its reconquest of Hispania throughout the 500s where the Visigoths would be pushed north to the Cantabrian mountains. Here the remnants of the Visigoths would establish a minor kingdom which would become the Kingdom of Asturias. Meanwhile, the Romans would be left with a lion's share of Hispania and a return of Mare Nostrum, as no other power would have any significant presence in the Mediterranean. But in the east, conflict with the Sassanid Persians was brewing, and in 602, the last Roman-Sassanid war would begin. Rome having secured the west would be a key factor in this conflict, as Rome would now be able to send more troops east. With this increased wealth, better strategic positioning, and a bit of luck, Rome would decisively defeat the Sassanids. This would leave Rome only slightly battered and with control over Mesopotamia. But this would be short-lived. To the south in Arabia, a new religion, Islam, had been founded, and the Arabs had united in a caliphate under Abu Bakr, a relative of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. The Arabs would invade and push the Romans out of Mesopotamia and the Levant, but the Romans would mount a successful defense in Egypt and Anatolia. At this point, the Caliphate would share a border with the Sassanids and fighting would break out. The Arabs were now focusing on the east and Rome would take this opportunity to regain the Levant and sign a peace treaty with the Caliphate, allowing the Caliphate to keep control over Mesopotamia in exchange for Rome keeping the Levant. Meanwhile, the Caliphate would see much more success in the east where they would completely conquer the Sassanids and invade India. Rome had defended their Middle Eastern lands and retained their dominance over the Mediterranean. But in the following century, Rome would face several invasions from various groups, mainly the Avars, various Slavic groups, and the Bulgars, a nomadic group which had become increasingly Slavic as they migrated. Rome would lose some lands to the Slavs temporarily, but eventually reconquer them. The Bulgars, however, would remain a major threat to Roman dominance over the Balkans. But to the west in Italia and Hispania, the Romans would face an even bigger adversary, the Franks under the rule of Charlemagne. The Franks would push the Romans out of northern Italia, but be halted before they reached the city of Rome. They would also manage to conquer a bit of Hispania, and Rome's power there would fade as the Asturian kingdom, a remnant of the old Visigoths, would take advantage of the Roman-Frankish wars and conquer lands from the Romans in Hispania. After a century-long standstill in the mid-800s AD, Charlemagne's descendants would finally split the empire, allowing for Rome to retake northern Italia.
This long period of conflict did take its toll on the Roman Empire, which was struggling against the Bulgars. Because of this, they were left with few men to spare in Hispania, and the province would end up in the hands of the now multiple kingdoms that had formed there due to Asturian inheritance laws, with the notable exception of Lusitania, a region of the Roman province of Hispania. Here, a Roman general tasked with defeating the invading Iberian kingdoms would declare himself emperor, as many generals had attempted throughout Roman history. But as he never had the means to take on the rest of the empire, and because Rome had other concerns, Lusitania would eventually become just another Iberian kingdom, which in its early years would have had a Greek-speaking elite. By the early 900s, the Romans would finally decisively defeat the Bulgars and once again enjoy a period of stability, but Western Europe would see many changes during this period. In the Roman Empire, Latin would remain a standardized language highly influenced by the local vulgar Latin dialects in Italia. This form of Latin would remain alive in much of Europe in churches and religious texts, but the plebeians and regular folk in Francia and the Iberian kingdoms would increasingly diverge from their Roman Latin-speaking cousins in Italia. This divergence would lead to the various Iberian identities as well as the French identity in West Francia. Rome, meanwhile, would become increasingly Greek-dominated, but Latin would remain a notable minority language in the empire spoken mainly in the province of Italia. It would also be an important political tool for Rome, as Latin would remain the language used in religious texts in the West, which officially remained in the See of Rome and under the Patriarch of Rome, a figure which was at this point practically a puppet of the Roman Empire. The kingdoms of Western Europe would fight amongst themselves, and Rome would interfere in their conflicts whenever it deemed it necessary. Most of the Middle Ages would be characterized by this Roman domination, as much of Europe would consist of Roman tributary states which would agree to pay tribute in exchange for protection. The only potential contenders to this Roman dominance would be West Francia, now the Kingdom of France, as well as former East Francia, now the Kingdom of Germany. They would, however, remain very disunited kingdoms with nowhere near the political or military power of Rome. The Middle Ages would, however, see two major conflicts that threatened the power of Rome. The first would be a war with the Seljuk Turks, the Turks had successfully invaded and now ruled over Persia and would start a major conflict with the Romans. The Turks would be defeated and remain in Persia, where they would be a significant force as they settle and establish various petty kingdoms after the fall of the Seljuks. The next major threat to Rome would arrive in the 1300s as the Mongols invade. The Romans would struggle against the Mongols and, much like with the Arabs, be forced back to the more defendable Anatolia. But once the Mongol Empire started fragmenting, the Middle East had been left completely fragmented and very weakened, allowing for an easy reconquest. The Middle Ages would eventually come to an end, and the Age of Discovery would begin. For centuries, Rome had dominated all East-West trade, leaving especially the Iberian kingdoms impoverished. Being at the edge of Europe, very little trade went through there, and this led to merchants and nobles exploring potential alternate trade routes. Lusitania would send expeditions around Africa, setting up trading outposts and establishing a trade network along the Atlantic coast. Eventually they found their way around Africa, opening an alternate trade route between Europe and Asia, which circumvented the Romans entirely. Rumors of a land to the west would also begin to spread, as several merchants accidentally sailed off course and discovered a vast uncharted land. This would lead to several expeditions being sent there by Lusitania and later Castile, the now dominant power in Iberia. While the Western Europeans were expanding overseas, Rome would focus on expansion in the Old World. During the 1500s, Rome would fight several wars with the Hungarians to the north, which would eventually end in a complete Roman victory and an annexation of the entire Pannonian Basin. Following this conflict, Rome would find itself at odds with the very disunited Kingdom of Germany, which they now had a less mountainous border with. Following several Austrian defeats at the hands of the Romans, the Kingdom of Germany would see an increased consolidation of power, which would make it an increasingly unified kingdom, more capable of defending itself from their powerful adversary. The terrain in Austria would also help them defend against the Romans, who would push no further into German lands. The remnants of Austria would be incorporated into the Duchy of Bavaria, making it one of the more influential powers within the Kingdom of Germany. A similar process of consolidation of power would occur in France during and following the Hundred Years' War with England. And thus, along with these new more unified kingdoms now setting their sights on the American continent and trade around Africa, would mark the end of Rome's monopoly on trade and unchallenged dominance over the continent.
Rome would, however, see some success in Eastern Europe, where it would defeat the Crimean Khanate. Rome would also expand their influence further by seizing land from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was crumbling after several defeats at the hands of the German Kingdom. During the late 1500s and early 1600s, Rome would also fight what was now the dominant Islamic power in the Middle East, Safavid Iran. Here, Rome would seize Mesopotamia. Keeping the land would be a bigger issue for Rome, however, as the local Muslims would not take kind to foreign Christian invaders. Mesopotamia would remain a very rebellious province of the empire, and Rome would give up their control over the region during a series of major wars in Europe, namely the Wars of Reformation. Protestantism had been spreading throughout northern and western Europe for the past century or so, and this would come to a climax in the late 1610s as Germany would be torn apart by religious war. The north was predominantly Protestant and rejected the old Roman system of patriarchs, whereas the south of Germany still recognized the patriarch of Rome's authority. The war would very much be about whether or not the nations of Europe rejected Roman dominance over it, as the religion was still one of the last remaining ways Rome retained a lot of political and cultural influence over Europe. Germany would be divided between a Protestant and Roman Orthodox League, as the German king embraced Protestantism, which the southern duchies rejected. France also supported the Protestants, as they too embraced Protestantism and wanted to rid themselves of Roman influence. The Kingdom of Sweden and the Kingdom of Denmark would also join on the side of the Protestants later on. Meanwhile, Spain, Lusitania, and the Tsardom of Russia would side with the Romans, as they had close ties to Rome and the Roman Orthodox Church. Although it started as a religious war, it very much became a political one. Still Roman Orthodox Poland-Lithuania, for instance, would also join the Protestants, as this would give them an opportunity to regain their eastern lands. The war would span over several decades and result in no one side really winning. Rome wouldn't accomplish its goals of eradicating Protestantism, and Germany wouldn't unite under its Protestant king either, but rather become a decentralized mess of several kingdoms, officially under the rule of the German Kaiser, who in reality held no real power. The next few centuries would be relatively peaceful for the Roman Empire, but it would be characterized by slow stagnation and decline in power for Rome, while the Western European colonial empires only grew in importance. Following the Seven Years' War, Brandenburg would also expand significantly and become a dominant power in Germany alongside Bavaria, while Rome became increasingly incapable of exerting influence over the rest of Europe. This decline in Roman power would become very clear after a defeat in a war against the Russians in the late 1700s, where Rome lost Crimea and their northeastern territories. Not many decades later, during the Napoleonic Wars, also referred to as the First Great War, Rome would play a minor role as an ally of France. Both nations were often at odds with Brandenburg and Bavaria, the dominant powers in Germany, and Rome hadn't had an interest in the old province of Gaul for centuries, allowing for a mutually beneficial alliance. During these wars, Napoleon would eventually be defeated, but Rome would come out relatively unscathed. What this war did result in, however, was an immense rise in power for Brandenburg, who would gain much territory in Germany. It would also become the de facto leader of the German Confederation, a successor to the Confederation of the Rhine, which was set up by Napoleon. This would eventually lead to the Franco-German War and unification of Germany in the 1870s, where only the Bavarian Empire would remain independent. In this war, Germany would defeat France, and Germany rising in power would become a trend going forward. This sudden rise would also lead to alliance networks being set up across Europe. Germany would form the League of Three Emperors, an alliance between the German, Bavarian, and Russian empires. Meanwhile, France would become an official ally of Rome, as well as their old rival of Britain, who was worried about the balance of powers in Europe after the establishment of this League of Three Emperors. Not long after, in 1875, this would lead to the war and sight crisis. Essentially, Germany was worried about how quickly France was recovering and rearming their military, and this led to a ban on exports of horses to France. Not long after, seeing that this didn't hold back the French rearmament, German leadership went forward with their plan of a preventative war. Their goal was essentially to quickly defeat France in the West, resulting in them submitting to German dominance in Europe and not rearming further. This plan would not come to fruition, however. Britain and Rome would come to the aid of France, 
and the Second Great War in Europe would begin. In the West, France would initially struggle against Germany, but the support of the British and Romans would prove enough to put up a fight against the might of the Germans. Meanwhile, in the East, the perceived sick man of Europe, Rome, would perform surprisingly well against the Russians. Although Rome hadn't industrialized as well as most other European powers, they were still ahead of the Russians. Rome would push the Russians all the way north and successfully hold off the Bavarians. The war would end with the Bavarians and Russians humiliated, a status quo with Germany who would only lose minor territories, and with the old powers of Rome and France re-legitimized as being capable in war against the newcomers. The humiliated Bavarian Empire would crumble due to internal issues, with the German portions joining Germany and the rest becoming independent. The Russian Empire, which had already been struggling with internal issues and nationalism, would also fall apart, with much of Eastern Europe becoming independent and later falling under German influence as they set up their Middle Europa alliance. This German hegemony would last for quite some time, but not forever. Following the war, Russia was struggling, and by the 1910s, this would result in a revolution, the Communist Revolution. After a fierce civil war, the communists would take power in Russia. The next few decades would be tense, as the Soviets began staging communist coups across Eastern Europe, where not all were particularly fond of the German hegemony, especially not in Poland. There was a successful communist takeover in Poland, and this resulted in direct German military interference starting the Russo-German War. Initially, Germany would push far into Poland, but their eastern allies would find themselves isolated easy pickings for the Soviets. For the first time since their rise, Germany would face a foe they could not defeat. A fully prepared and industrialized Russia. Following the Soviet takeover of the Baltic countries and eastern German allies, the war would come to a standstill in Poland, where both powers would focus all their might. This would become one of the deadliest wars in human history, with Russians throwing their massive industry and manpower reserves at the less numerous but better equipped and engineered German military. Just as the Germans were being pushed out of Poland, the Western powers would step in to avoid a complete communist takeover of Germany. This would be the beginning of the Cold War. Germany would sign a peace with the Soviets, with Western-aligned oversight, giving the Soviets some territory and leaving the Russians with a firm grip on Eastern Europe. The Western powers would from then on prop up the German Empire and incorporate what remained of the Middle Europa alliance into the new NATO alliance, an alliance against the Soviets and communism. This Cold War would continue, with each side spying on each other and with the Soviets staging communist revolutions across the world, most importantly in China. Here the nationalist government was battered following the Pacific War, where the United States finally defeated Japan, allowing for the Soviet-supported Chinese Communist Party to take power. The Cold War in Europe would come to an end when the USSR finally collapses after unsuccessful reforms in the 80s and 90s but it would continue in Asia, where China would become an increasingly powerful force as it embraced a unique government-controlled form of capitalism. And this is where we are today. Rome, alongside Germany, stand as the few remaining empires who title their heads of state as such. Although their governments have both become increasingly democratic during the 20th century, Rome and Germany are also the dominant forces in Europe, whose alliances going forward are not so certain, as the Russian threat is no longer as great, and there is less of a need for NATO and American support in Europe. Rome is certainly not the center of civilization like it used to be, but thanks to support from the Western powers, major reforms, and the successful industrialization of the empire, Rome has once again become one of the world's most powerful nations, a position it arguably only lost briefly during its time of struggle, more recently in the 1800s, while nationalism was on the rise and it had not yet properly industrialized. But that's all for now. Stay tuned for part 2, and don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it. Also remember to subscribe and hit the bell button if you want to see more content like this in the future. See you in my next video.